Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats Podcast, where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Balthazor. And, uh, wow. I, I can't say I expected that one. I was going to lie and say I did, but it's just not worth going down that like joke track. Because, I yeah. mean, not, not a single person on earth expected that outcome. Yeah. So uh, Oklahoma State got taken to the OK Corral and just got absolutely obliterated. K-State won 48-0, to zero, which is the largest blowout and shutout against a higher-ranked opponent in college football history. Since the AP poll started in the 30s, which I think was the Lynn Pappy Waldorf era for K State football. <laughs> so, fun, fun trivia fact. Yeah. Uh, fun. But, but, but speaking of the AP poll, with this victory, this dominant Wildcat victory, the Cats are now ranked 13th in the country in the AP poll, the highest we've been in the climbing era, and the highest since 2014. So, as a good friend would say, we are gargantuan. Indeed. We are, in fact, gargantuan. And honestly, if you look at uh, the AP polls uh, uh, right now as they stand, I think that we're honestly better than a few of the teams in front of us. Like, I think that we would, like, beat several of them. Like, there's a... I think I think we beat Utah, like, for yeah, example. We beat Utah. Like... Uh, so, I mean, there's an argument that this is truly a top 10 team and we've just stumbled a few times, which yeah. it is what it is. I'm not going to be upset about being ranked 13th, but no, I'm not either. Yeah, ha- happy to be there. Um, it was a little higher than I expected, honestly. Oh, yeah. I expected it's like mid teens. I didn't expect this yeah. to be 13. Yeah. My hope was 15, but I thought realistically it could get up to like 12 or 13, but I didn't actually think we'd get to like 12 or 13. Yeah. So I I was hoping for 15, expecting to get like 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, to go into the specific game is uh, we can just start with the general recap. And, and there's nothing that we can really say that you wouldn't be able to guess by the score. The offense was humming right along. The, the, the starting quarterback ended up being Will Howard. We'll talk about it in a second. And yes, we are happy. And <laughs> uh, vindicated as well, but the it seemed like there weren't any times throughout the entire game where the offense looked out of sorts, or no time that the offense even looked anything below, like above average. They constantly looked above average, and most of the time actually looked really great, yeah. and that's. I, I can't say I really expected that because I, okay. I wanted it to happen. I didn't expect us to be consistently great. I expected us to be consistently good at touching on great, but it's, I, I think it's fair to say that the offense exceeded expectations, at least in my eyes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. <laughs> uh, the offense definitely definitely exceeded expectations um if you go back and look at the drive chart uh the team had uh four punts uh to go with six touchdown drives um and then two field goals as well so their points per drive i don't know exactly what it was but it's out of this world (laughs) um i mean like just like this drive chart is just it's very fun to look at (laughs) <laughs> uh, just a, a lot of good vibes here uh, for the, the K-State offense. And I think you put it well, too. Um, there wasn't really ever a moment in this game uh, where I was sitting there thinking, wow, this offense is like uh, completely out of sorts. Even the drives where we had back-to-back punts to end the first quarter, I wasn't sitting there worried because I it, it wasn't because like I know one of those drives, I think, had the... Uh, uh, the Deuce Vaughn, um, uh, like where he broke open, it would have been a long touchdown, but mm. it, oh, yeah, he it, just missed it. it. Yeah, it because Will had to get that throw out a little bit faster than he wanted to because of some incoming pressure. 
and it just was over the wrong shoulder. And those were really Will's only true misses on the day, uh, save for maybe a couple others. He didn't really have any turnover-worthy throws. Um, and there were a few misses where it was just under pressure and forced to get it out faster than he wanted. But for the most part, he was putting it exactly where it needed to be uh, pretty much almost 10 times out of 10 uh, with a few phenomenal throws uh, mixed in there as well. But yeah, a, a ton of credit has to go uh, to Will for for leading. Um, I think he personally led, it looks like, about 11 or 12 drives, and we scored on seven of them. And only punted through or four times when he had the ball, which one of them was pretty late. So I, I hardly care. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, offense as a whole was just simply outstanding in this game. Yeah, it can't be said enough. And another thing that can't be said enough is, you know, we got a shutout too. <laughs> the defense was great, even without key contributors. You know, we had excellent performances from a linebacking core that I think there were questions about. And I think rightfully so. Because you're without your best linebacker in Daniel Green. He's hurt and maybe hurt for a couple more games. And then you missed the first half with Khalid Duke. But it seemed like that group didn't play poorly at all. Mostly off of the back of Austin Moore having, again, playing out of his mind. But even Nick Allen, who was subbing in at the Mike linebacker position, Des Purnell had a good game. It, it was the defense was great and it took it was opportunistic as well. They weren't letting anything get by them they were just suffocating everyone <laughs> yeah the defense was just absolutely phenomenal i mean pitching a shutout against anybody is really really difficult um and they they managed to do it against the ninth ranked team in the country <laughs> that was considered to be one of the most explosive offenses in the entire country coming into this game so the fact that they did it at all and were able to do it in the fashion that they did um, and be as dominant as they were, um, it was completely unexpected, especially with uh, key injuries such as uh, Daniel Green um, being out and missing this game and Khalid Duke um, missing the first half because of his uh, targeting suspension. Uh, definitely thought the linebackers might be a weak spot, but honestly, they ended up playing really, really well. Um, I, I was completely taken aback by that. Um, even Nick Allen, who uh, didn't play phenomenally against TCU, he honestly had a really good game. Uh, yeah. Probably the best game of his career. Jake Clifton, um, as a true freshman, Chris Kleinman said he's not redshirting, period, and he's going to be rotating in a lot more. Um, he uh, he was really good, too, uh, I thought. Um, uh, especially because Mike... Uh, I, I think he was saying something about how Mike wasn't his uh, main position. position and he, it's not. Yeah, yeah, he got told on Thursday, hey, you're going to be the backup Mike uh, on Saturday. And uh, had, two, okay. <laughs> had, I think, one practice at Mike and just really pitched a really solid performance there. Uh, so he, the future at linebacker, at least with Jake uh, so far, we haven't seen Toby at linebacker yet, but Jake is going to be really, really good. But defense was just phenomenal on yeah. Saturday. Picture perfect. Yeah, if if you want to a, a sort of microcosm of this defense, and and this is not meant to be at shade at Gunner Gundy, he he did what he could. But the gif of his hands shaking, half of it has to be adrenaline. The other half is, I don't want to be here, Dad. Can we please go home? <laughs> yeah, a lot of it definitely is adrenaline, like you said, but. At least some of it has to be, it's got to be terrifying to go into that situation uh, and and have to deal um, um, with that defense that you just saw um, completely neutralize uh, uh, the, this offense that you've watched be so successful uh, over the course of the season. So it's, a, it's an unfortunate video for him, but, you know, it is what it is. He, yeah. And it was unfortunate that the situation that Spencer Sanders, you know, obviously all the all the wishes in the world to Spencer Sanders to get healthy soon. But at the exact same time, you and I both looked at each other on the whenever he got knocked out and he said, get you some crunchy boy, because that. That was not pleasant. <laughs> no, not, not at all. 
Uh, that was that was a uh, a pretty rough hit. Um, Gunner Gund, I, I guess if you want to say one thing for him, uh, he led the team in rush. <laughs> he did. He did lead the team in rushing. And even though they only had 217 total yards, Gunner Gundy's um, last drive was responsible for I think like 43 of those yards. So Oklahoma State was staring right in the face, sub 200 yard performance uh, against K State. Uh, Because they're going into that final drive, they only had 174. Um, But I mean, they ultimately have that. I I was about to say throw. I wouldn't say it qualifies as a as a throw. But Gundy responsible for the interception. Yeah, as a shovel uh, to Crew Jackson, who (laughs) ends up getting a phenomenal pass coverage grade on BFF because of that one play. Um, Just I don't. Just a really. It was difficult to digest in the moment just how good the defense was, but. I've looked, gone back, looked at highlights, digested it more. And I mean, that, that was one of the best defensive performances I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, any team. team. Yeah. Especially short Daniel Green, who is so important to how this defense rolls. Uh, it, it was simply unbelievable. Yeah. And we already kind of mentioned it earlier, but there are some, some young slash new contributors. We don't have to spend much time on it because we just did, you know, Clifton, Purnell, they both played really well. Gavin Forche is a new arrival. He's been pretty good. So yeah, I, you know, Jacob Parrish got some snaps. He was good. It was it was all fun. And speaking of fun, it was a fun game, and it was a fun game even before it became what it was. Like the environment was truly a great one. You know, there's a there's a picture out there where someone's uh someone's I think it's a Fitbit. It was either a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. That basically said something in the effect of "Please get out of here. You are going to damage your hearing because it was so loud." Yeah, yeah I saw that somewhere. It was, uh, oh yeah, it, it was something about like I think it was like a no, like sustained noise over like a hundred decibels or something like that. And definitely in the loud moments, it was definitely more than than that. <laughs> so yeah, it was a it was a great environment, a raucous environment. I honestly think it'll be even worse or even better, I should say. Worse for uh worse for everyone's hearing and worse for Texas on the field. But what's worse for Texas is better for not only God, but this entire universe. So <laughs> <laughs> uh <laughs> but yeah, so now we can move into stats. I covered defense last week, so I guess I'll cover offense this week. Starting off with passing, Will Howard was 21 for 37, four yards short of 300, 296, four touchdowns, long of 41. I'm so happy. I'm so unbelievably happy for Will. And and we'll talk about him more in game day grades, but that, you know, he also had five attempts on the ground, you know, net of three yards, long of one. I think two quarterback sneaks were in there. Yeah. But, you know, rushing wise, Deuce had 22 attempts, 160 yards, uh, or at least uh, a net of 158 yards, a touchdown long of 62, 7.2 yards per carry. DJ Giddens is once again proving why he's the RB2. So he had seven attempts, 44 yards, one touchdown, and a long of 12 yards for 6.3 per carry. Receiving, this is where it gets interesting. Because Malik Knowles had his best game and with the, the his best game in, as in his K-State career. And also this made his what this made him pass his season mark for both receptions and yards in a year. Yeah, he now um, has he broke his previous yardage record of 436. He's up to 447. And he also uh, broke his receptions record, which was 27 last year. And he now has 32 this year. And I think also this was his best game statistically for both receptions and receiving yards. Receiving yards, I think, was like by like one yard and receptions <laughs> was by two, I think, because his previous best was six. So this was Malik Knowles. Um, other than not having a touchdown, which he should have, he definitely yeah, got he, in. He got um, robbed. Yeah, which Deuce Vaughn still got a great touchdown of it. So it is what it is. But Malik, this this is probably his best game as a peer receiver at K-State. Yeah which he had eight receptions, 113 yards. Cade Warner, again, continues his breakout recently. Five receptions, 97 yards, two touchdowns. Phillip Brooks had two catches for 41 yards and a touchdown. Uh, 
Ben Sinnott, one for 25. Deuce Vaughn, four for 18 in a touchdown. DJ Giddens, one for two. And then Sammy Wheeler and Will Swanson are both credited with drops. So this is, you know, a, such a solid offensive performance from, from all parties involved. But, you know, especially Cade. Cade. Cade's really come on these last few weeks. I really think that they're, weirdly enough, I think him and Will have better chemistry than him and Adrian, which is so strange to say. Yeah, I think you might be onto something there. And Cade is another player that has set season best marks. Like, because like right now he's blowing his previous like best seasons like out of the water. He's more than doubled his previous best receiving yardage numbers, which was last year. He only had 124 yards last year. He's got 270 right now. Uh, and then 21 receptions is his best uh, um, relative to his previous best of 17. And he's got four touchdowns this year. Those are all four touchdowns he's had in his career. He, that's his first multi-touchdown game as well. So Cade, he has been playing on fire the last few weeks. Uh, that 90, This 97-yard performance has by far his best game in his entire career as well. Um, he he has really been... The coaches have raved about him a lot. But we're again, a lot of guys recently, coaches have raved about for a while. And the last uh, few games, we're kind of finally seeing um oh, on field okay. results for it yeah so. yeah but now we can you can take defense yeah so oh, there's a lot of guys listed here um because <laughs> a lot of players uh got some significant playing time nick allen leads the way in tackles with a half a tackle for loss and then a qb hurry as well nick allen had an, a simply outstanding game um he was the fourth highest graded player on bff 88.3 Run defense grade, uh, really, really good. 78 overall. Um, Austin Moore was really good too. Five tackles and then a big forced fumble on what was Oklahoma State's pretty much only good offensive play of the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Just completely negated it. Uh, and he had a QB hurry as well. Um, Kobe Savage had four tackles, as did Sincere Mason. Uh, Drake Cheatham had four tackles and a forced fumble. Um, and he also he had a really great run fill early in the game where mm -hmm. he just completely stood up a running back. That was a really nice play. Jake Clifton had three tackles, and uh, I've I've loved seeing him play early as a true freshman. He's going to be really good down the stretch for K State uh, and into the coming years. Um, Josh Hayes he had two tackles, a tackle for loss, and a pass breakup. He had a big third down pass breakup early, and then that tackle for loss was cleaning up Felix's mess uh on a fourth down that was a huge play a huge momentum swing jacob Parrish had a couple tackles another true freshman coming up big for the defense felix had two tackles uh and a sack uh honestly should have had more i just i really had to skip a few people yeah. um but uh he was getting held the entire game i'm gonna leave it at that it is what it is yeah. they weren't calling <laughs> um, it on either side so i'm not gonna yeah. complain yeah it is what it is gavin forche um, had probably his best game as a Wildcat uh, thus far, uh, grading as the fifth highest uh, defender on the team with some really good run defense and tackling, uh, which was kind of what he struggled with against TCU. He had two tackles, one and a half tackles for loss and a pass breakup. Brendan Mott had two tackles, a sack early in the third quarter and a fumble recovery from that Austin Moore forced fumble. Uh, he just kind of fell on it, yeah. <laughs> honestly. It he actually didn't there. fall. He never... He was never ruled down. He could have ran it back for a touchdown. He was never ruled down. Well, that's a he shame. Just gave up. <laughs> he just gave up, assumed he was down. I mean, that, which is a fair assumption because I thought he was down. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Echo Boydo had a tackle and a pass breakup. He should have had like five pass breakups in this game, but Oklahoma State, uh, they were just, it was just offensive passive interference constantly from them. It wasn't really called. Um, that must have been really frustrating for Echo, but also a sign of just how good he is. Yeah. So I, I won't complain too much. Clay Duke had a tackle, uh, only played the second half because of targeting. Desmond Purnell had a tackle and a QB hurry. Crew Jackson, he was very impactful in his like one one or two drives. Yeah. I uh, he had a tackle, um, which was a sack and then an interception of Gunner Gundy uh very late. Uh, in the game that led him being the highest graded defender on the team uh, in just 11 snaps, 94 rating and a 92 coverage grade. So crew Jackson for defensive captain, I guess. Um, 
Then we get to the very end here. Damian Elilio had a tackle. Uso Sayamalo had a tackle as well. They both played some at the end. And then Toby Osunsanmi, uh, he played special teams and had a big kick um, kick coverage tackle. So that's, mm-hmm. I think, his first tackle as a Wildcat. Uh, so good for Toby. He's going to be an absolute monster. I was watching. I saw him on the field on the kick coverage, and I said, I'm just going to watch Toby on this. And uh, I told and you that. And, and he he was fast. He was outrunning people smaller than them, like defensive <laughs> backs. He was outrunning defensive backs, and he's a linebacker, and he's huge. And he was just – I can't imagine being on kick return unit and turning around and seeing that guy running at you. That's <laughs> absolutely horrifying. Um. Other than that, I would just start crying. There's nothing you can do. I would just sweep the leg. That's all I could do. (laughs) (laughs) Take the tripping penalty. It's all good. Uh, That would be better than like, I don't know, the long term brain damage that you would get. (laughs) Turning into powder. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, congrats to Toby on his first tackle. And then Drew the East Brands didn't actually have any tackles, but he did have an interception. Um, I felt like he was very impactful in the game. I felt like he was doing a lot despite not really registering on the stat sheet that much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Julius, again, he's been having a, a great senior season. He should be all Big 12 when it's all said and done. Um, I guess I'll cover some special teams as well. Didn't really have a ton in that regard. Um, Philip Brooks had some punt returns and he had a couple good ones, um, including that last one at the end. He was really close to the um, punt return touchdown. Ty Zentner punted four times. Yeah, it was very, it was very close. Yeah, he actually did the finger motions like I was the yeah. biggest close. I saw, I saw it on the on the highlight, which I, I thought was funny. Uh, it was just kind of that point in the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ty Zender punted a few times. Had I think one that wasn't very good. Then had a couple inside the twenty, and then a long fifty yard punt as well. Um, which granted, I'm not going to be too hard on him because he was doing a lot of things. He was wearing a lot of hats because yeah. he also kicked two field goals, uh, had nine kickoffs, and made six out of six on um, point afters. So Ty Zender was doing a lot for the special teams unit. Um, so even if he wasn't punting the best, he made two field goals, made six extra points and had five touchbacks on nine kickoffs. So Ty Zentner have a day. Uh, he he was doing more than most uh, specialists are ever asked to do. So a uh, good day for him. Sorry, I accidentally opened GeForce experience on my computer trying to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> I could see the panic in my face. <laughs> I was trying to I was trying to figure out what was happening because I was I was like, am I supposed to say something? <laughs> like... No. Okay. All right. Now we can go into game day grades where we go through and give every single position a grade from F to A plus, F meaning they near single-handedly lost us the game, and A plus meaning they near single-handedly won us or had an acceptable performance. Let's start off from the very top from the man taking the snaps, and that is quarterback. Now, I know what people are going to say. No matter what, you're going to be insanely biased because you've been one of like five Will Howard stands and supporters on earth. I very simply do not care. Will Howard was making some of the most insane throws that I've seen from a quarterback in like in college in general. He was making some really good throws. And it wasn't just based off of his arm strength. He was doing it with touch, which is so rare that you see in a college quarterback. The best throw that I've seen from a K-State quarterback, I know, well, maybe it's tied with the Skylar Thompson uh, throw to Sammy Wheeler last year in the West Virginia game. But I'm thinking of the throw to Ben Sinnott up the seam where he threads the needle right above the linebacker's head and puts it quite literally in the only spot where it was possible for Ben Sinnott to catch it without it getting picked or broken up. Huh? Yeah. He can make that throw. <laughs> I, and he made a number of throws that there were no wildly inaccurate throws. There are a couple of throws that could have been unfortunate, but there was nothing that is egregious. You know, you could make an argument that he should, that Malik should have caught uh, the deep fade ball that was thrown to him. You could, you could make an argument that Deuce should have turned his head around to catch a wheel right faster. I, I'm not going to make either case. I'm just saying that those weren't bad throws. They were actually quite good and generally accurate ones. Will Howard has quite, he's made a lot of people proud. He's proved a lot of people wrong. And for that, 
and the fact that he had an insane performance, he gets an A plus for me. And you could argue that it's biased. This is the one time that I will say the bias very simply would not have mattered because this is by almost every objective measurement, an A plus performance. Yeah. Will was absolutely excellent. Um, another, I, I could talk about that Ben Simmons row, but I will pick another one to point out uh, what a great day he had, uh, which was the third and goal at the end of the second quarter um, where we start under center uh, and then we do uh, um, quick audible, uh, switch to a different formation, Deuce goes into the slot and Will puts the ball in again, quite literally the only possible spot that Deuce can make the catch and it would not have been broken up or intercepted by uh, the incoming defender. It was a perfect out ball um, and Deuce made a great catch. Uh, Will, that, that was an unbelievably confident throw. I think that was, that was probably the big difference. Uh, um, and Will, I think the fans can even tell like uh, as well, generally speaking, that Will looks very confident compared to how he's felt uh, or how it's looked in the past, I should say. Um, he was just stepping up when pressure was coming he just would move a little move out of the pocket and make make the big play uh he kept his eyes downfield uh more effectively than he has in the past um he was awesome this was one of the if not the best kc quarterback performances i've seen in a single game in a very very long time um he uh probably could have had more honestly um <laughs> if yeah. we're gonna get greedy um but it just wasn't necessary because i mean we were up, we were up already i think by the time he got pulled 41 zero honestly i think we left him in a little too long i yeah. think what they were trying to do was get him to 300 yards and i think they wanted him to get a fifth touchdown because that would have been the school record and i colin klein is a little sentimental honestly as, as a offensive coordinator i think <laughs> Uh, which is funny. I won't hold it against him. Um, but uh, I think that I really do think he won a will to get the record, uh, but wasn't quite able to get it. He tied it instead uh, with the, his four touchdowns. Will was phenomenal. He truly last week, people were skeptical. I think I even saw people blaming him for the loss this week. He undeniably was the biggest reason that we won this game other than the defense, of course. Um, he would, he, it was a really special performance from Will Howard. Good enough to the point that people are already calling this the Will Howard game. Yeah. Uh, as it goes down in K State lore. And I think that's apt. Uh, that's, I, that's I, fair. I mean, yeah, it should be the Will Howard game because it, it really is. This is the, this is the game that will go down as the Will Howard game, I think. Um, uh, assuming we don't win like, the big 12 title with him or something or a natty <laughs> next year but um an a plus for me um i was just elated watching this game and watching will just have an absolutely phenomenal performance um in every in every sense of the word um he he deserves this more than most i would say yes he does um, like the, it it I said this last week. It feels so strange for me to say as someone, he's like only a year younger than I am, but I'm just so proud. <laughs> I'm just so proud of him. He really does deserve this um, because it's clear that he's much more comfortable uh, throwing the ball in the system that we have right now. Um, he's clearly gotten so much more confident from last year. And he is getting the ball where it needs to go effectively and had some incredible throws. Like the fourth down throw to Cade was incredible pocket navigation by him. And, and a dot. And an absolute perfect pass, 45 yards through the air, going to his non-dominant side, getting his feet set quick enough, which by the way, he fixed his feet. And, <laughs> yes. And he uh he makes a perfect throw. Uh, in between two defenders um, to Cade Warner. Uh, Will, uh, he he deserves every bit 
of uh, credit um, that he gets. Um, because I, I think that we can probably say now that it, it is not a fluke. I think people were worried that TCU was a fluke. Will Howard's just good. And yeah, you know, I'm I'm so happy that he's finally showing it. Uh, he, he's finally evolved as a quarterback enough uh, to get to that point. Uh, but he he deserves every game ball, every bit of credit, um, and absolutely everything, which is so funny because other players had phenomenal, like yeah. career defining games, but Will <laughs> was just special. He was on a different level, like with all this like backstories and like whatnot, uh, playing into it and like struggling for a couple years as a young quarterback. So much played in and led to this game to make it mu- even more satisfying because of Will Howard being the guy to lead the charge. Uh, there, there, there's just a lot of dynamics at play that I just don't have the energy to get into right now. But a plus 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 whatever but phenomenal game for will howard yep next up are the running backs deuce vaughn and dj giddens both had an absolutely excellent day deuce returned back to his deuce form not that it ever really left it's just you know I feel like he had one game this year. It was either one or two games where he didn't get above 100 yards, but every single other game, he's just been himself. And then DJ Gins is still showing why he's a legitimately good RB2 option. Deuce, <laughs> I'm just remembering the play where he should have been absolutely tackled for a loss. And then he just decided, I will be opting not to. And then just embarrass the poor guy, the poor linebacker who was coming downhill to tackle him. It was only like a one or two yard gain, but that is probably one of the most impressive one to two yard gains I've ever seen. I gave the running backs another A plus. Yeah, they earned an A plus uh, from me as well. Um, Deuce, on a wider note, he is 98 yards shy of another thousand yard season, uh, averaging his most yards per game, most yards per carry. Um, Probably won't hit his touchdown mark from last year. But, I mean, he had a phenomenal game. He averaged 7.2 a carry. That is just absolutely nuts on 22 carries. And DJ Giddens was really good, too. Um, he he ended up getting a touchdown late. Uh, he he looked really powerful, incredibly athletic uh, in space and uh, with, uh, with power, too. A-plus for me, they were just really, really good. And Deuce had that absolutely excellent uh, diving touchdown grab, too. Yeah. Next up is wide receivers. And man, I, what a turnaround, huh? We went from questioning if these wide receivers could separate to facing two teams that, <laughs> granted, their secondaries are not amazing, but they proved that even against a Big 12 Power 5 secondary, that like, yeah, you're, oh, no, 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 yeah, they can separate. No, <laughs> they, they can do that. They're good. Uh, They're just pretending not to. Yeah, they were just pretending not to. The To me, the more and more I thought about it, originally I was just going to give them an A because I'm like, eh, well, you know, maybe they could have done this a little bit better. But at that point, like, really? Am I really going to split hairs that much about a wide receiving room that has had so many questions and also just, like, got nearly 300 yards? Well, the receivers probably got, like, what, 250, somewhere in there. But Around, yeah. like I ended up giving them an A plus. Cade Warner hat is proving himself. He's breaking out. Philip Brooks is still proving that he's a reliable option. Malik Knowles is finally living up to his potential after so it, long. It only took five years, but Malik Knowles is finally living up. He is finally reaching his potential. I and that's a, that's something that's kind of flying under the radar. I'd say right now. Yeah, I ended up giving them an A plus. I'm glad you did that because we were talking about our grades last night and I gave him an A as well uh, for a bit. Um, But I was thinking about it during the episode. I'm like looking at these stats and I'm like, I can't really justify that as just an A, like especially relative to how they've been playing. Like that's an A plus. And I was so I was like, you know, if Ace moves it up to an A plus, I will. And then you did. I was like, okay, well, now I have to. And they didn't even have any drops that I could think of. Zero drops, zero drops. Um, they caught everything thrown their way. They were focused and they were really good. And I was all without really rotating at all. Um, there really just wasn't rotation at that position. Like RJ played like six snaps, like Seth Porter played four, I think. 
Um, they just didn't see the field all that much. Um, Malik Knowles, he sets career marks and receptions and receiving yards and single game receptions and receiving yards too. Cade Warner has his first multi-touchdown game. Philip Brooks had a great touchdown grab as well. They get an A+. Plus. They were absolutely excellent. And they they deserve the recognition for that A+. Plus. They were really, really good. Next up is tight ends fullbacks. And I'm sorry, they're not going to get another A+. Plus. I wish I could. I wish we could keep the A+, plus train rolling. But the main things that kept me from giving the uh, tight ends fullbacks an A or an A+, plus, I ended up giving them an A-, minus, was they were just okay in the blocking game. Will Swanson had a really, really bad drop. I know that's not like the perfect ball, but that's still someone, that's something you have to come down with. And I would have liked Ben Sinnott to come down with that ball. It like that, the second ball up the seam, it, it was again, could have been a little bit more out in front of him to make it more of a basket catch. But at the same time, I do expect a tight end, especially one as good as Ben Sinnott and how he's proven to be. I still expect him to make that catch against a, a safety that I don't think was particularly great. But I ended up giving them an A minus because, you know, they were good when we needed them to be. But their blocking was just okay, and they had two, not costly, but one drop, I you could argue was not a drop. You could just say it was a pass breakup. One was a definite drop, and that led me to giving them an A minus. Yeah, I gave them an A minus, too. They probably should have had a B plus, but I was feeling pretty generous in light of a 48-0 to zero victory with a ton of A's being thrown around. Yeah, that's so. fair. I, I gave them an, an A minus for that reason. Ben Sennett had that great catch on a phenomenal throw. And once again, did the thing where he just makes a catch and then just like gets a few extra yards just by wanting it more, really. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they blocked decently, I thought. Uh, um, Sennett had some nice blocks. Wheeler had a few solid blocks as well. Swanson did have a pretty bad drop early on. Um, it, it was a little behind him, but it hit him like right in the belly. Um, he, he should have made the catch and he knows that too. So I won't harp on it too long, but um, backups came and played well. Christian Moore did a good job blocking as well. So I gave him an A minus on a, on a day where it's just good vibes being spread around. So. Yeah. All right. Speaking of good vibes being spent around the offensive line, they only ended up giving up one sack against I think probably the best defensive front that we have seen and will see this entire year. Texas has more stars. I don't care. They're not as well coached. I, <laughs> I, I, I can't give them anything but an A plus in how they played. And the things that come to mind is Cooper BB constantly staying busy in pass protection. Hadley Pans are committing assault on a screen play. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was uncalled for, Hadley. <laughs> There's, I ended up giving them an A+. Plus, and the only thing that I think you really could ding them on is the two false starts by KT. But at this point, I think that's just kind of what KT does. He wants to get a head start, and sometimes that causes him to flinch, which, okay, fine. I'll take the good with the bad, and if it's only two penalties, okay. If you're only giving up one sack, okay. If we're getting 170 yards on the ground, okay. <laughs> I, that's an A-plus performance. That's an A-plus performance. Yeah, I gave him an A-plus, too. Um, and BB was really great per usual. Um, I mean, we've we've gotten pretty used, pretty well used to Cooper BB being excellent. He had an eighty six point five pass block grade on PFF. Um, really, really outstanding stuff from him. Um, as I understand, yeah, there was Will Howard was not sacked in this game. Um, he was hardly even pressured. Really, I mean, there were a few times where there's some pressure leaked in, but a lot of times it wasn't enough to really get to him. Uh, and he would just readjust. Um. Hadley Panzer had probably his best game uh, as a starter for K State. Um, Gillum was pretty solid too. Um, Duffy had a really good game in pass protection as well. Honestly, uh, again, I mean, and this all is against a really, really good defensive front. So again, they the offensive line one hundred percent stepped up this week and earned every bit of that A plus. Uh, when I mean, when Will Howard is throwing for almost three hundred and the running backs are combining for. Uh, 200. Yeah, they, they get an A+. Yeah. 
So moving on to the defense, starting off with the defensive line. Now, I know that people will kind of get a little bit angsty because I think what we only ended up with three, four sacks. I think it was three. I think it was three. But here's the thing is that they also only got like 80 rushing yards. And I don't think that's net. I think that that's total. <laughs> that's that's um that's before loss. After losses, they had 54. Yeah. So you may say, oh, they only got three sacks. Yeah, but they were playing the run just about as well as they've played it the entire year. They were playing the run in an insanely disciplined way. They were getting pressure even through holds. And there were a few times that, yes, with a three-man rush, we weren't getting there. And Spencer Sanders had enough time. But I honestly think a lot of that was contain rushes, saying, okay, Spencer Sanders, beat us exclusively with your arm. And Spencer Sanders said, no. (laughs) So... There are a couple of plays that stick out in my mind. Obviously, the the Felix TFL uh, that Josh Hayes helped clean up. Eli Huggins quietly being really good as a nose guard and being able to flow with the run at an insane level. Matt Lick getting you know very close to a couple of sacks, which seems to be the the common reprieve with Matt Lick this year. I ended up giving them an A plus, and you know it. The A pluses keep rolling and. Not to spoil it, there aren't any other grades for me that are below an A+. Plus. And you know what? I'm exactly the same. Fun <laughs> fact. Um, I, I gave the defensive line A+, plus too. Uh, they were phenomenal in the run game. Oklahoma State got over half of their positive rushing yards on their final drive against entirely backups for the most part, other than I think Matt like, got like a snap or two. Um, uh, I, I mean, it was... Uh, absolute dominance on that front the pass rush at times uh was i i i won't even call it lackluster it's just they were um playing contain a lot on the defensive uh end side of things um it seemed like uh felix was getting held all game they weren't calling it either way but i mean he would have had more sacks they still get three sacks though um and they generally were really really good Brendan Mock got a wide open sack. Felix fought through a block and a chip, uh, split that and uh, got a big sack. Uh, but I mean, it was just, again, really a just dominant performance on the front from the defensive line. So an A plus for me. Yeah. Next up is linebackers who we thought would be the biggest question. I, I, I'm not even going to say the grades anymore. The rest of the grades, including coordinators are A plus. <laughs> I, the linebackers had a shockingly good day. Nick Allen led the team in tackles, which I didn't expect. I expected that to be Austin Moore. But Austin Moore may have had the most impactful play of the entire day. Because the one time that Oklahoma State got anything going on offense, Austin Moore simply said, "Uh, I don't like that, and then stripped the ball. And then all of their momentum for the rest of the game was gone. And even Dez had had a great day. No, no matter what his PFF grade says, Dez had a great day, especially for someone who's been a backup up to this point. Gavin Forche is showing why we took him as a Juco late ad and why he was getting interest from USC. <laughs> and I think it was Texas. Texas was the other, or was it LSU? It was Texas or LSU? Um, It was oh? Texas, okay. I believe. But either way, the linebackers had an amazing day absolutely blew my expectations out of the water as they've kind of done for the majority of the season. Yeah. The linebackers were phenomenal uh, in this game. Austin Moore, yeah, like you said, he had that incredible forced fumble. Uh, Gavin for shake exceeded my expectations. Nick Allen definitely exceeded my expectations for him. He was really, really good um, and played to his strengths. And Khalid Duke came back in and immediately helped out the pass rush even more. Desmond Purnell was good. Crew Jackson somehow made a ton of splash plays and like 10 snaps. Good for him. I'm just surprised is all. Yeah. Um, um, and then, yeah, they um, did all this without Daniel Green, without Khalid Duke for a half. And then they even lost more depth at Mike with Bo Palmer being out for the year. Uh, and then Jake Clifton at true fresh as a true freshman had a really good game. He nearly had an interception mm-hmm. uh, in the second quarter, I believe. Uh, that it, it was ultimately picked off by Brent. But the reason I even point that out is because he had no business being even close to that uh, interception. He went up and uh, nearly snagged it just inches away. 
uh, so showing incredible athleticism. Same similar thing happened later with Forche. Uh, he actually got his hands on it, and just again, if Forche, if it was if it was Crew Jackson and not Forche, it would have been a pick. Uh, yeah. So like, that's how close he was, like a couple inches. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the linebackers just they killed it. They were awesome in the face of probably the most adversity they felt all year, and they deserve a ton of credit for that. Yep. Now, the last position group is defensive backs. And, you know, Echo proved, again, why he's Echo Island and also why teams that want to take one-on-ones, they shouldn't do it against Echo. Because every single time that they tried to go vertical against Echo, it ended up resulting in what should have been an OPI, but nine times out of ten was just a pass break. (laughs) And one DPI that probably should have been OPI. But... Echo was amazing. Julius had a pick. Drake Cheatham was great, especially in the run game, especially in that one play where he filled it. Josh Hayes did exactly what he needed to, had an amazing game. Jacob Parrish was good subbing in. I don't remember anything. for. Oh, wait, no. Kobe Savage had the one penalty, but that's just a part of Kobe Savage's play style. You kind of eat those whenever you have someone who plays as fast as he does. A+. <laughs> Yeah, defensive backs were awesome. Julius Brent, he quietly had a really good day. He only had the one interception, but he was really great uh, for the most part. Um, Josh Hayes had a really good game. He had the excellent pass breakup early on a critical third down. Jacob Parrish playing more and more, it feels like. Uh, he's pretty much become the main rotational corner at this point, even uh, surpassing uh, Omar Daniels, uh, which is incredible that a true freshman has come in and played as much as he has um i'm not i, I swear Ace, it's okay nobody expected it <laughs> and, uh but kobe savage was good sincere mason had a really nice day as well Cheatham, like you said had that great run fill um and then he also quietly did force a fumble um on a um rare positive play for oklahoma state <laughs> and uh it just happened to bounce right back to the receiver and so yeah. he fell on it but it was a um, another thing, I listened to Austin Moore's interview, and um, they've actually been emphasizing uh, strip sacks or, or uh, like um, going for the strip on tackles, like uh, more often than not, and that that's become more of an emphasis for them in game. So that explains why we see it so much uh, from a guy like Austin Moore, who's so talented. But yeah, um, and then Echo, like you said, should have been a ton of offensive pass interference called uh, when Echo was in coverage. Uh, I, I don't think they ever did, or maybe once. I don't think um, they ever did. Yeah, it was pretty ridiculous, especially the time when they called defensive pass interference on him. I I, I have no idea. It. He was in perfect position and he gets called for DPI anyways. I I that there's nothing he could have done, and I no. felt really bad for him. Yeah. Um, but he still he still he probably should have been credited with more than one pass breakup is with, with how well he played. But yeah, a just phenomenal day. And I have all A pluses from here on. So like Yep. Next up is Colin Klein. And oh boy. <laughs> I as the offensive coordinator, there was times that this year I'm like, okay, where's the creativity? Where especially, you know, during the two lane game, I was I was very down. It was like this is a very uncreative offense. Like it was very run in the mill, very cookie cutter. Colin Klein took the TCU game, said, all right, I'm getting better. And then he took the Oklahoma State game, said, all right, hold my beverage of choice. I'm going to go nuts. <laughs> and then just quietly called the best game he's called and the best called offensive game in probably years. I, this is – I. I, I don't like calling many things master classes because I think it's not only an overused term. I think it's a term that oftentimes gets used incorrectly. This is one time that I'm going to use the term. It was a master class of offensive play calling. You know, sending Ben Sinnott in motion across the formation to get a tunnel screen that no one sees coming because that's not how people set up tunnel screens traditionally, but it works because they don't expect it. That we still, okay, one play is just straight up stolen from KU. Uh, Cards on the table, the play design where we have one of our H-backs or wing tight ends work up the same, that's just straight up stolen from KU. But if you're going to steal something, steal something that works. 98% of offensive play calling is stealing. Like that, 
Like the defense, you can get a bit more creative, but on offense, it's literally just stealing. I don't like, I know that there's a lot of people who have delusions of like, oh, he's so like, you have to be so creative. Like, you can be the least creative person on earth if you're an offensive coordinator, if you just know how to steal the work of creative people. In other words, if you're a really lazy college student, you may be a really good offensive coordinator. <laughs> but I, I, I've, I've talked enough about that. I want to leave some, some points for you, Connor. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that Ben Sennett, uh I'm coming across the formation tunnel screen because I was going to bring that up in a slightly different context um, because I was thinking about how uh, about how we, we, we talked about on the show before um, counter punches and I don't remember which came first, but um, we had at least once um, a motion across the formation uh, or out of the backfield with Deuce to deflect attention towards one side of the field to go opposite side for Cade Warner as a touchdown on a screen. Uh, and then you go uh, another time motion across the formation, but this time you go with the motion, albeit it's Ben Sennett, not Deuce Vaughn, but it sets up um, something else. Uh, and the defense has been uh, conditioned to um, expect it to go opposite direction because of what he did last time. Instead, it goes to Malik Knowles. One person reads it right. It does not matter. And, <laughs> he gets uh, cracked back by Ben Sinnott. Yeah. And uh, it, but I loved that that play design. Receivers were running wide open most of the game. Um, and even when they weren't, Will was putting it exactly where it needed to be. Like that Ben Sinnott play up the seam. That was a perfect ball from Will Howard. Uh, Cade Warner down the sideline. Perfect ball from Will Howard. Deuce Vaughn on the out in the end zone perfect ball i mean phenomenal phenomenal game for colin klein scheming scheming ways for his players to get there uh to get theirs uh spreading the ball around and everybody producing uh, at a really high level as well and then also spelling deuce more uh i appreciated we saw more dj giddens um early in the game than we have for a little bit i was happy to see that uh getting deuce a break um but yeah, uh, just uh, a, a really, really, really great game from Colin Klein. Definitely his best uh, that we've seen so far. Um, and guys, I promise last week was not Colin Klein's fault. It's, it no. never was. Oh my God. And then I think this week helps to at least show that to some degree. He knows what he's doing as the offensive coordinator. Um, and it's a bit of a thankless job. Yeah, but he... He really, really earned his stripes this week. I think he he was great. Um, a, a, another A plus. Yeah, yeah. And then Klanderman, I don't. We don't need to spend much time here. He gets an A plus. Like blitz designs, good, perfect play, like perfect coverage calls, nearly every single time. Trusting his defense, knowing exactly when to put on the brakes and to just step on the gas. He shut out a power five team. He shut out a top 10 power five team. I don't, what do you want me to say? <laughs> That's not something that happens. And I mean, like people really have to understand that what case they did offensively and defensively to Oklahoma state is completely out of left field and unusual. That's not something that happens. Uh, especially when you're not a blue blood, um, especially when you're the lower ranked team facing a top 10 squad. Yesterday was as close to a perfect game as you can get, I think, uh, for a college football team. And I even still, they left points on the field at multiple occasions. Uh, so this, this game could have gone a lot worse. And there was never a moment where I felt like Oklahoma State was truly threatening, um, like offensively. The defense was phenomenal. They were exactly where they needed to be the entire game. They were suffocating. Um, and they all played assignment sound football. This was the best game that the defense has played in Kleiman's tenure. Um, and they deserve a ton of credit for it. So, yeah, just another perfect grade for the defense. Yeah. So now with the game day grades out of the way, we can answer the pregame questions we had, which aren't as ironic or funny as last week. Well, they're funny in a different way. But the first one we had was, is this truly an injury bowl? Uh, for K-State, it ended up not being. We were a lot healthier than I thought we would be. We were down Adrian Martinez and we were down Daniel Green. That was about it. 
Uh, it was very obvious the entire game that Spencer Sanders was dealing with a lot of pain and a lot of ailments for Oklahoma State. They were down a couple of their players. Brock Martin did play. That was a plus for them. But it, it, they they noticeably were missing a few key pieces, and you can definitely tell. But it wasn't to the point of it being an injury bowl. And I think even if Oklahoma State was fully healthy, we, we don't shut them out, but they don't win. Yeah. I think that's fair. I mean, because Case Aid was, of course, missing people. Adrian didn't play. Um, and then Daniel Green obviously missed. Uh, and then Bo Palmer out for the year. Um, and then like Julius Brent's coming back from injury uh last week, um, but looked fine. Um, uh, yeah, so Oklahoma State missing a lot of guys, um, but not to the point of it being an injury bowl, like you said. Um, it was close, but I mean both teams were missing a few people, key positions. So Yep. Related, who starts a case uh quarterback for K State? Will Howard. Big Willie Howitzer. Big, big Willie man. Howitzer. My boy. Uh do the receivers separate against another man heavy team? Yes. Yes. Absolutely they do. They do. <laughs> Will Howard specifically said it in his post game presser that uh they identified that Oklahoma State ran a lot of man and they specifically thought that they would be able to get a ton of separation against them. And so they, they were going for that the whole time. Yep. Uh, can K-State run on what is probably the second best defensive line in the Big 12? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely they can. The first they best were... is us. <laughs> yeah, they, they got whatever they wanted uh, in the run game uh, in this game. Uh, and, the, I mean, yeah, there were a few times where Oklahoma State did play well. They had, like, one play where they stuffed Deuce. But other than that, that was it, really. Um Deuce had the one long touchdown and then several other big chunk plays and making people miss left and right. I mean, yeah, Casey State absolutely could run and did run on this great defensive line that Oklahoma State has. Yep. Uh, do Kleiman and Klanerman increase the amount of rotation to keep the bodies fresh against a team that loves hurrying up? I imagine if Oklahoma State was averaging more than like five plays a drive, they would have. <laughs> Yeah, it, it really wasn't necessary. Now, they did rotate at linebacker a decent amount. We saw 26 players uh, ultimately take snaps on the defensive side. Stuff will be in played more than I expected. Damien Leo got snaps late, but that was more just kind of a backup thing. Um, yeah, but not many players played a ton of snaps. Echo and Julius both played uh, 46 each. Josh Hayes played 42. Uh, Nick Allen played 41. Uh, other than that, yeah, they were mostly in the 30s, really. Kobe Savage played 40, but they they didn't have to rotate a ton, not as much as I thought they would, but a decent amount. Uh, we saw more Gavin Porsche um, this week, of course, but yeah, yeah, there was some rotation, but it wasn't really necessary to keep bodies fresh more, like like from a conditioning standpoint, more just to like switch up looks and get different guys in. Uh, who wins the turnover battle? K State. We didn't turn the cats ball did. over. <laughs> yeah, the cats did. Cats easily win the turnover battle. Yeah. Uh, what does the linebacker room even look like? Uh, it was mostly Nick Allen at Mike, backed up by Jay Clifton, Austin Moore at Will, and then Des Purnell at Sam, and then subbed by Gavin Forche. And Khalid Duke played a little bit of defensive end, which was yeah, interesting he did. towards the back end. Yeah, he but, played a handful of snaps at the end. Yeah, that those were the pregame questions, and we came away with answers that I'm quite satisfied with. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty good, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Now we can go into MVPs. This should be obvious. Offensive MVP, Will Howard. <laughs> My man, Will Howard. He is the obvious offensive MVP. There's nobody else that I could conceivably go to. Maybe, I mean, Deuce had a great game. He ran for almost 160 in a touchdown, had a great touchdown reception. However, Will Howard unfortunately existed for Deuce on this yeah. on this day. So, uh, yeah, Deuce, any other week, it'd be you. But Yeah, this week it's Will. And defensive MVP, I feel like there are a couple of of big ones that you could talk about could talk about echo and how he played 
could consider Austin Moore for the impactful force fumble, could consider Julius for the interception, could even consider Eli Huggins for how forceful he was in the running game. I'm going to pick Austin Moore because I think he had the most impactful play of the game. And I mentioned it earlier, the only time they had any offensive momentum, quite literally Austin Moore just stripped it away. <laughs> so Austin Moore. Yeah, that's a fair pick. I'm going to go ahead and go different because we've said so much of the same stuff this episode. I'll oh. say Echo because his coverage was absolutely fantastic. Um, he um, definitely got interfered with more than once as a defensive <laughs> player, had a phony call against him uh, once. Uh, he was really, really, really great, I thought, and added in a tackle, um, had a pass breakup, but definitely should have had more than one because um, there were multiple occasions where uh, he was being interfered with and could have had an interception or a pass breakup, but the defensive player was more focused on uh, keeping him away from getting an interception uh, than actually like trying it's to get It's a conspiracy, I tell you. It's a conspiracy to make sure Echo never yeah. gets a pick. I was convinced on that play in the first quarter, on that play down the sideline, he was going to get his first career interception, but the the, uh, the offensive player ended up just tackling Echo instead. <laughs> and just didn't even get called. I was so upset for Echo in that moment. But I'll I'll give him some consolation. Uh, he, he's a defensive MVP. Uh, you, I also could nominate you for defensive MVP for defending me tearing my vocal cords on a <laughs> on a <laughs> on a delay of game. You saved my vocal cords. I was I was maybe one or two screams away from tearing something. <laughs> Yeah, because to be fair, they did not notice that for like a full three or four seconds after the clock hit zero. And uh, you were like, you you were about to like lose your voice for the next week because of it. But they they did throw a flag. So I had to put a stop to that. You I couldn't let like you. Ace, Ace, they threw the flag. Ace, they threw... You had to tell it to me like three or four times. Yeah, you were in. Uh, you were seeing red in that moment, man. Like you, you were about to lose your mind. The... I was out of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I I cannot confirm how angry I was, but that is. Uh, it's not one of the angriest Connor has ever seen me. I just well, actually, it might be. <laughs> it's Probably, up there. I think it was. Yeah, it was close. Uh, it was the top three, I'd say. But but it was. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll get, I'll, I'll take co-defensive player. The guy wasn't as good as Echo, but <laughs> all right. Now we can talk about the takeaways from the game, and um, the first one's going to be a topic I think on every single K State podcast and on every single K State fans, you know, mind for the next week. Tuesday press conference will be very interesting to see how it answers this question. Because I think K-State may have a quarterback controversy on our hands. I I still think that Adrian gets the job. I still think that he probably will be the starting quarterback. But that being said, I absolutely do not envy Coach Kleiman in having to answer that question. Because Will Howard has played unconscious in every single snap that he's gotten. And it genuinely looks like it'd be very hard to justify redshirting him now. Yeah. I I think if the staff truly is more comfortable with Will than... Uh, Adrian running the offense, I think the retro conversation just has to go out the door. I mean, I, I don't think they should worry about it at this rate um, because even, you know, if, I mean, because Avery will be here next year, Will would be a senior technically and then would have a COVID year if Avery doesn't develop to the point that they were hoping for. And even mm-hmm. then, there's still other quarterbacks on the roster. Yeah, so, like Jake. Yeah, there's The Jake, real loser is Jake. <laughs> Yeah, Jake, Jake, yeah, Jake, Jake really is the one that kind of loses out in this situation, probably. Um, Jaron Lewis is existing. He is doing something. I don't know what it is, but and then Adrian Lara, um, probably another potential loser in this situation. Um, but yeah, there's a absolute there's absolutely a controversy here. Um, I mean, if I'm climbing, I have no idea what to do because I mean, 
we win this game today, at least partially because of Will. Will keeps us in the TCU game um, and, and gave us that big lead. Uh, but also, we'd probably win the OU game because of Adrian and his playmaking ability. Um, and a similar story against like Texas Tech. I mean, both, granted, this is a good kind of controversy to have. Yeah, which it's, it's is, not because both are yeah. bad, it's because both are yeah. good. Yeah, it's like the opposite of like what Texas Tech is dealing with, where they had three quarterbacks and combined they threw five picks against Baylor. So, like, like Tyler Shuck's first throw was a pick six, like, which is just a shame. Donovan Smith threw a pick. Uh, I think a couple. Uh, Baron Morton threw a few. Like, this is not that situation. This is you have two really good quarterbacks that do two different things. They have two different play styles, and if you had to ask me right now, the answer, the, my honest answer is I have no idea who should start because I really like Adrian and I really like Will. And I think I could see a path to Arlington with both of those guys at the helm. And that's, I think what the question has to be, who gives you the best chance of getting to Arlington in that moment? And I, I'm still not hundred percent sure how I feel about it. We're going to have a, a so we're gonna have time to think about it. I I don't envy Chris Kleiman for being forced to make this choice. Um, if I were a betting man, I'd wager it'll be Adrian, but yeah. I I don't think it's by much at this point because Will has definitely given the coaches more to think about than they bargained for. I think so. Uh, I I do not envy those guys at all for having to think about this. But yeah, and I, I it. I think the way that I would sort of sum it up is by saying, if we think the rest of the teams on the schedule are going to knock us out of structure more often than not, the answer is Adrian. If it is a defense that if we believe that the rest of the defenses of these next few weeks will not disrupt our structure on offense and how it works, I think the answer is will. So looking ahead at our future opponents, <laughs> the, the worst part is, is that using that paradigm does not help give the answer. Texas has the talent to be very disruptive. Baylor has the scheme to be insanely disruptive as they shown against Texas tech, West Virginia for all their faults. They do have a defense that has pieces I, you know, KU, their defense is terrible. We can stay in structure against them. But so basically you have two options of, yeah, they can be disruptive. So Adrian would be the better choice and two options, well, one and a half options where it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, we can stay in structure. So even using that paradigm, there's, there is no clear cut, clean answer. And I, that's, I think, what makes it such a difficult choice. Yeah. Um, it is a very difficult situation in a good way. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still picking a good quarterback to lead your offense. I mean, yeah. like there have been worse QB controversies before uh, at K-State. So um, like the Joe Hubner, Cody Cook debacle, <laughs> it, it could certainly be a lot worse than Will Howard, Adrian Martinez. Um so, but yeah, I, I think we can move on from, from that takeaway. Uh, I guess uh, Will's developed. Yeah, we, we already just talked about that one, so you can take yeah. the next one as well. <laughs> uh, good for good for Will. He has developed. Yeah. Uh, the offensive play calling um, has been improving weekly at this point, and I, I 100% agree with that. I mean, uh, TCU play calling was pretty good except for a few moments there really wasn't a time against Oklahoma State though that I felt like the play calling was like questionable right nope it was good entire game I 100% agree I I was very happy with it um for most of the game I uh, I was happy to see us take some stuff from other teams use some counter punches um and mix up play calling a lot and then also um we didn't really run well at all. Uh, it's clear there was some stuff in the TCU playbook that was meant for Adrian that ended up being uh, 
transferred to Will. That just didn't work as well. Um, and we didn't really run Will. Part of it was just because we just didn't need to. Um, part of it was just because he, he did look a little awkward running the ball at times against uh, TCU. <laughs> he, he's gotten slower. He, he's definitely gotten slower. He's put on weight. Uh, like he's put on a ton of muscle. Uh, and that's just made him a little bit slower. Um, all I know is that I hope he doesn't try to switch to tight end anymore. But <laughs> if I see a single per, I don't care if it's a joke. If I see a single person, I like, say, "Oh, can we move Will the tight end anymore?" I may, I may just blow multiple blood vessels in my brain. I, I, I couldn't <laughs> deal with it. I can't deal with it. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you because I mean, I was like always the joke storyline in the off season. I think it's fair to say that's not happening. Some, some people weren't joking. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, some people were not joking about that. But I think we can put that storyline to rest permanently. Please, please. I'm not asking. <laughs> I'm not asking anymore. <laughs> and Will isn't either. <laughs> uh, next up. Yeah, if if we perform like that for the rest of the game, like for the rest of the season, uh, we don't just beat everyone else. We blast everyone else for the rest of the game. And I'm talking even if we end up going to like the Cotton Bowl or something. Like if we play like that mm-hmm. and we keep living up to that, if we even get close to that, we blast everyone we faced. Yeah. Um, on that note, because I agree with that, I'll ask like a slightly different question. Um, I, I asked this to uh, to Scott Wildcat as well and the uh, Ask Bosco uh, Q&A that they'll be doing, which everybody should check out uh, whenever that comes out, probably Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, what I asked him, and I'll ask you the same question, um, is what game outside of Texas on the schedule worries you the most that's left? So the rest of the games are West Virginia, not in order, is Baylor, West Virginia, and KU. Yes. Of those three, which worries me the most? It's not KU. I I think KU has fallen firmly to earth, flat on their face. Um, They kind of look like Tom in the Tom and Jerry cartoons whenever he, you know, gets hit in the face with a frying pan. I'd wear it just like kind of flat. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's between West Virginia and Baylor. Both are away games. Baylor has the better defense, but Morgantown scares the ever like it scares me a lot. <laughs> um, hmm. I think Baylor's the better team, but Morgantown's the better environment. Hmm. I'm going to go West Virginia. because, And it has almost nothing to do with the team. Because I'm not afraid of a toe sucker at quarterback. I'm not afraid of that. Um, <laughs> Poor JT. <laughs> JT is going to catch straight. How did he survive against TC? <laughs> How did he do I, that? I, I, I do not know. Uh, well, part of it's their defense isn't good. But... Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's true. But, um... I think West Virginia worries me more because Morgantown has basically been hell for us. So yeah, I, I don't know. How, what do you think about that? Well, for one, I think there's a better argument. I don't think it's KU, but I think there's a better argument for it than you, <laughs> you, 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 you uh, made it uh, seem because I think that there's going to be a lot riding on that game because if you look forward, assume, hypothetical k-state wins out its next three games ku loses out its next three games it's going to be k-state fighting for arlington eligibility uh and the i think ku fighting for bowl eligibility for the first time in however long so it's gonna there's gonna be a ton it could it's shaping up to be the highest stakes sunflower showdown in decades uh, which the last one would have to be one of the ones in the early 90s where both teams were ranked. And so that could play into it, but I still think that we match up decently with KU, uh, especially uh, on our offensive side to their defense. Um, and then other than that, I mean, yeah, it's kind of a toss-up between Baylor and West Virginia. West Virginia, definitely not a great team, 
but they might be getting the like interim coach boost by that point. So we'll see. Uh, because uh, um, interim coaches, they always like teams always just seem to get a little boost. It's like when they have an interim goes like a stat pad, I guess. But yeah. And then Baylor, they really did. Uh, I'm take it to Texas Tech. Uh, I think Baylor is a better team than their record shows, especially as long as Aranda's their coach. Uh, they they're going to worry me. And going down to Waco in November with anything on the line frightens me. I have bad memories of that, but yeah, that's uh, fair. I I feel like there's a solid argument for all three of those games, and I I really don't know what the answer is. That's why I'm asking you. That's why I asked Scott because I I just want to know what to think. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> Just somebody yeah. tell me what to think because I don't know. Yeah, I'd I'd go West Virginia just because Morgantown scares me. Fair. The thing is, is that anyone in the Big Twelve can beat any anyone else. Even Iowa State, who's you know at the bottom right now, I feel like even they, you know, they've gotten some bad breaks and they've been one or two plays away from a a, a non called targeting here from from beating a, a team. Uh, by the way, if you want confidence, at least from a preliminary watch before diving deep into it. If you want confidence about the Texas game, watch the Iowa state game. <laughs> and that's <laughs> yeah. But you know, the last, the last two, the, the last one is always just, you know, the stereotypical I am happy or I am sad, but Clement has finally just gotten rid of the monkey off his back of Oklahoma state. He's finally beat them, which means there's only two schools in the Big 12, he has yet to be in his three-year tender, which is Baylor and Texas. So that'll be a question on the <laughs> – not not to look ahead here, but that'll be a question on the, the preview episode for Texas. But I, those, are, those, are the so next two, yeah, those are the next two games. So Kleiman has a big three-game stretch here. He's already um, taken out one. Uh, but he's got two more games where he can finally best the teams that have bested him. Or um, every time, so uh, he won't be thinking about that. He truly, I doubt he cares. But no, I, it's interesting I don't. for us, if nothing else. He does, Nick. He does not care. He does not. He's he's pulling the Mike Tom. We do not care. We do <laughs> not care. Yeah, I. That's it. So, Connor, you have the the last little, not the I am happy, but the the next game. Yeah, yeah next week we've got Texas in Manhattan. Uh, 6 p.m. primetime kickoff on FS1 for now. Maybe it gets moved to Fox if there's no World Series Game 7. I'm not really sure how that works, honestly. I don't even know if they can do that, but I hope that they do. The bad news is, though, that I think it's with Tim Brando again, um, and that just sucks. It does affect <laughs> I mean, us. We'll be yeah, there. We'll, I'll be there. Ace will be there. I truly apologize for everybody that has to watch the game with Brando commentary. It might be worth it, honestly, to sync up Wyatt Vision instead of listening to Tim Brando like have words come out of his mouth. So Olaf. I Olaf what's Kansas. That? Olaf Kansas. Olaf. Yeah, Olaf Kansas is weird Twitter spree about Adrian Martinez. Just, just I don't think there's words. I don't think that there's a fan base that hates a com. I don't think there's like a hatred between a fan base and a commentator more than there is between Tim Brando and K State. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Like there's there's probably some obvious pick, but like I mean the entire it feels country like in the Yankees network, but that doesn't count. Yeah, that 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 is that's too specific. That's like too broad. But <laughs> um, but it feels like he's got like half of K State Twitter blocked right now, and. I don't know, just not looking forward to it. Hopefully it gets flexed to Fox if that's a thing that they can do. I imagine it is. Yeah. Because uh, they'd rather have that on than nothing. <laughs> and, yeah, because the alternative is like nothing. Or like, yeah, like reruns of like random network shows. I imagine those would not do as well as <laughs> uh, Texas K State. So, no. Um, hopefully that gets flexed. We shall see. But yeah, that really puts an end to talking about what was maybe the most complete performance from a K-State football team that I have seen in a very long time, maybe ever, when you consider the opponent. I it, I struggle to think of a time that I can think of 
where K-State played this well against such a high-quality opponent, the only thing I can think of is West Virginia 2012. That was a slaughter in Morgantown of a top-10 team. That is the only comparison I can think of that I remember. Um, but, wow, just what what a game. What a game. What a game, absolutely. So see you next time, and we do the preview. But thank you for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. If you want to contact the show, please be sure to follow us on Twitter at Aggieville A Cats. That's capital A, capital A, and capital C and Cats. If you want to email us, we're Aggieville Alley Cats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at AC Edwards 00. I am at Connor Bouncesor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store, where you can find such designs as the staff-approved Doom Tang Clan, Play Sandstorm Cowards, and Neon Alley Cats. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to live to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats.